Hey everyone, and welcome to Spelled Out Gaming Channel's first class profile. Now, all of us out there who are fans of Dungeons & Dragons know that we hold near and dear to our hearts one special class. Maybe it the artistic savant bard, or maybe the battle-hardened barbarian. And with great reasons, we all love these classes. But maybe it's because you played this fantastic character who is similar to Guts from Berserk, but somehow more epic. Or maybe for the rule lawyers or min-maxers, and I don't mean any offense, but uh, you just like the damage output potential of a well-built fighter or sorcerer. And uh, because of all these reasons, I kind of wanted to talk about my favorite class, whom since the fifth edition feels like they've been, well, not getting any love at all. <laughs> I mean, let's be frank. It's the Ranger. And yeah, before you stop the video, please, 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 please. I, I just, you know, I just don't, or before you write me off as a lunatic who has no idea what I'm talking about, I will admit, I'm the first one to admit, that when the fifth edition came around, the Ranger has felt, well, kind of massively nerfed. But in my current game, I will also admit to be playing the revised ranger rule set which you know we'll talk about the differences near the end of this in a bit I'll also kind of go over on why i think the revised rules are better but not great the ranger is your classic archetype from the more roguish style like aragorn in lord of the rings or more behind the scenes range offense like legolas from the same story to a surprisingly well-balanced, frontline, dual-wielding, horde-stomping badass. Yeah, right? The Ranger does seem, on paper, to have a lot of values in their favor. So why do they feel so weak? And what can be done to make sure you, in my opinion, your crucial role of the backline defense, how can it be a fulfilled experience for you as a player? Well, let's get started. Actually, the Ranger's kind of uh, surprisingly chonky, you know? They got a D10 hit dice, a, like a fighter. He's, you're proficient in strength and dex. You got medium armor and shields and martial weapons, all of that good stuff. And for Halfcaster, it plays more like a fighter at times than a paladin. In fact, if anyone came to me and said that they like the style of the rogue, but want but thought it was, you know, way too weak, my first sentence would be, have you looked at the ranger? But, you might say, I hear the ranger's super weak. And, you're correct. If you don't take careful attention to how you build it, though. Otherwise, could be a good build. Many of the ranger perks deal with the unknown parts of your story, and the DM may or may not be willing to share. You have to pick a favorite enemy. Maybe you take giants. It ends up being a demon hunting game. Well, pick a favorite terrain. Maybe you go forest. Well, maybe you do a complete dungeon crawl and you do endless times inside of caves or on sides of mountains and maybe it's a dwarf build game. Well, you're kind of out of luck there. Ugh. You also need to kind of spread your ability scores out quite a bit. Dex for your ranged attack or dual wielding, wisdom for your spells, constitution if you think you might have to be on the front line with the tanks from time to time. Do you dump your strength score even though you receive proficiency in it? I would. <clears throat> what about role playing? No charisma, no intelligence to show for it? If you want to survive to level 5, ugh, right? This leads me to my next point. When I build a ranger, I do favor a dex wisdom build. Strength is nice, but you'll find out you'll be, well, ranging mostly as a ranger. Let's be real. There's a reason they call it ranger, and they give you a bow. And even if you're not doing ranging, you'll find yourself quite, quite up front with, you know, dex weapons anyways. A rapier, maybe a short sword. If you want to dual wield, that's the way I would go. You get five ability score increases, which is pretty par for the course for the rest of the classes. A dex wisdom build lets you have the option to multi-class as a rogue, a fighter, even without strength, because fighter is dex or strength, 
druid, cleric, and monk. It's quite a tall list if I say so myself. A druid multi-class gives you more potent AoE magic as well as fighting prowess. So it would play for you more like if you did a fighter wizard cross-class. And rogue and fighter are never bad mixes for a multi-class, especially since they synergize super well together if you take the hunter subclass. Also, straight ranger is no joke in light game, especially with certain situations like hordes that you would need to ask your DM if you're gonna be encountering quite a bit. I played a game where we had tons of horde combat and I was playing a fighter and I gotta say, at that point, I wish I had ranger. Let's go over some of the ranger features. The first one is Primeval Awareness. You can spend a spell slot to sense if certain types of creatures are in your area. Not super useful. If it's one of your favorite enemies, it expands the range quite a bit. But, uh, you know, the amount of times I've ever used that in my five times playing Ranger in 5e, not very often. Extra Attack. Well, that's amazing. Any class has extra attack, you're going to be waiting for that level 5. Uh, this does not stack with fighter. If you decide to go fighter for level 5, you only get the one extra attack. However, if you went ranger 5 and get that extra attack, and then you went fighter 11, whenever they get their extra attack, you would get the two extra attacks. However, the one you got from ranger would be would just disappear and then they would they would both come from the fighter land stride you're not slowed by non-magical difficult terrain and you have an advantage on spells that cause them that one's actually pretty cool and pretty useful especially if you have an arch nemesis that's say a druid hide in plain sight you spend a minute to hide yourself and receive a plus 10 stealth while not moving this one's pretty cool and it's actually super cool. However, I will admit, I've been in games where the DM has completely nerfed that. They, in the book, it says you cover yourself with, you know, uh, you camouflage yourself and then you get a press up against a wall or a tree for cover and you basically can't be seen. And uh, it, it works pretty well for me, you know. I, as a DM myself, I would say hide in plain sight. Well, that makes perfect sense. However, I've been in a game where I was inside a room and it was a big room and I, you know, spent the minute to dress myself up to look like a, uh, a bookshelf and hid in a bookshelf and my DM wouldn't allow it. Now, by explicit reading of the, the book, I'm going to say he was probably wrong there. And if it was my campaign, I would have allowed it but it wasn't my campaign so i just did not have that so uh, something to talk to your dm about what does hide in plain sight mean to them that's a good question since it's a really big feature for the ranger vanish uh this one's pretty cool it's, it's similar to the rogue hide can be used as a bonus action and you cannot be tracked by non-magical means this will be very great and but also very redundant if you decide to take the rogue. So, you know, if you're cross-classing or anything, which pretty much nowadays all my characters multi-class, so Feral Senses. This one's really cool also. You don't receive disadvantage by creatures you can't see and by creatures that are invisible. So if there's an invisible enemy in the room and they attack you, well, guess what? they don't get the advantage on the hit on you, or you don't have disadvantage on hitting them. It is actually super cool, especially if you're fighting enemies that like to go invisible a lot. The final feat for the ranger is Foe Slayer. And this one's pretty, pretty flat. You just add your wisdom to your attack or damage to your favorite enemy, which means if you started without a wisdom build, you might need to, at this point, be using your ABIs to put into Wisdom. That is if you're going straight Ranger. And also, at the end of the day, we're talking about, you know, maximum of five, uh, unless you have any magic items that boost that up. So five extra damage per hit. But we'll say at level 20, maybe you have a magic bow, maybe you have you know, the crown of wisdom enhancement, you know, epic legendary version, you get a little, a little plus six. 
It's nothing to laugh about. But that being said, not quite near uh, some of the other level 20 features. The player's handbook only has two subclasses. While Xanathar adds some extra, the Ranger Revised only includes two from the player's handbook and one from the supplement material. But for today, I'll only be covering the ones from player's handbook. The Hunter subclass. In Ranger Revised, the Hunter Conclave. This one is my favorite for several reasons. It blends the combat power of the fighter with the survivability of a rogue. You can take Colossus Slayer from level 3 for constant damage. At level 7, you can choose between several great defensive perks. A cool and occasionally broken multi-attack at level 11, letting you attack a maximum number of 8 by melee or nearly 16 medium creatures by range. That is, depending on how surrounded you are, of course. <laughs> All ending up nicely with one of the most, one of the fantastic rogue dodging skills at level 15. I will admit, however, with the ranger's typical archetype of being a backline fighter, most of these defensive skills can feel wasted, unless you have a good DM not afraid to put pressure on you and your backline every now and then. And if they do, the ranger will keep your healers and arcana friends as safe as if they had their own personal war chief escorting them. The Beast Master. Before the revised version is a little dry. You can't pick from very many animal companions, but don't let this stop if you want to build a super flavored or even druid cross class ranger. At later levels, the beast can share spells similar to a warlock familiar, meaning you get more bang for your buck with your tight budget on ranger spells. Also, if you're fighting enemies with resistances, your animal companion having their attacks count as magical will definitely boost you past a hunter ranger for raw damage output without the need for rare or legendary weapons. However, in the ranger revised rule set, this class gets boosted quite a bit. So if you so if you talk to your DM allowing those rule sets, you'll find that your half druid fighter ranger build feels quite potent. All right, so let's be honest. Since this video is getting quite long, I'll just share why I prefer the Ranger Revised rule set and pop a link to them in my comment section down below. The main reason is to help the Ranger feel less niche. I've built several half-elf and elf rangers that once I've left my favorite train, I felt like I was hard capped at level five. Now you can essentially attune to your new environment by traveling through it for an hour to grant all the benefits of your favorite train, not just a select few. So you want to move without disadvantage, you want to move in your group, you want to forage for twice as much food, just walk in that area for an hour and bam, all those benefits are yours. You walk for two days and you're new. now you're in a new biome, bam, another hour and you still get those benefits, super cool. You can get advantage on enemies that haven't attacked natively now and on initiative rolls, pairing oh so sweetly with the rogue assassin build. There is a few favored enemy buffs of a flat two damage, kind of like the rage counter table, but just flat two into later levels. You're still quite niche in that ability if you're not attacking your favorite enemy. At least it offers you some purpose and reason for picking a favorite enemy. I'll be honest, on the standard D&D 5e &D games, when I played by the old rule set, I never even picked one since it only offered a tracking bonus, which, you know, was rendered moot when my party's wizard had a locate creature. The Beastmaster has a significant boost to its effectiveness at the expense of losing multi-attack, made up for by coordinated attack with its animal companion, whereas the hunter remains mostly the same. You gain your main benefit for running Ranger Revised is for the boosted Ranger features in the early game, as level 11 Ranger does tend to feel a bit more balanced, but it is such a drag in the early levels, I'm surprised anyone would take it, and that's coming from a huge Ranger fan. In the end, don't write off Ranger just because you've heard your friends talk about how weak it is. Where it can be weak, in very specific situations, it can nearly outclass the fighter. However, these situations are rare. You probably should be in consistent contact with your DM to even see if picking a ranger is worth it. Regretfully, like with most other classes, a bad DM can wreck your fun on ranger. Unfortunately, 
with how specific you need to build and play the ranger, you can feel like you're not contributing in the slightest if this is the case. So whether you're the type to butter up your DM with compliments and treats, or just need to sit down and tell them why you want to play the ranger and pretty please allow the ranger revised, I think it's a great class. Not the best, and nowhere near broken, but if done correctly, your ranger can leave you with some very fond memories. This has been Spelled Out Gaming. Make sure you like and subscribe. If you want to see more things like these class profiles, or if you want to see us talk about our favorite spells or other games, put them down in the comment section below. If you have any ideas of videos that you want to hear from us, we have read the books probably as much as some of you guys, but maybe even more. So, you know, we're willing to talk about it all day long because we love the game and we really enjoy doing this for you guys and we enjoy playing the game and talking about it. So, like I said, like, subscribe, comment what you want to see, and we'll see you in the next video.